Welcome back to the channel to what's a slightly different video than normal. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague Felipe Schreiberg, co-founder of Protective Cask, and he'll explain exactly what's going to happen in this video. Hello and welcome, everybody. I believe we are now live. Uh, so my name's Felipe Schreiberg, and this is our little webinar, uh, Scotch Whiskey Cask Investment, uh, The Law, the scammers, and you. So I'm about to add to the stage uh, my protectyourcast.com co-founder, Mark Littler. I'm going to add him to the stage now. And there's Mark. And joining us as well, Mr. Blair Bowman. So what I will say quickly, somebody's got my That's audio me. on from the two of you. Turn me oh, off. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> started. So it's all good. Gentlemen, welcome. So I'm going to do a very quick introduction of the of the guys we got here with me. Mark Littler is a phenomenal whiskey broker, writer, uh, media mogul, because he is now the editor-in-chief of the Whiskey Wash as well. And together with Mark, we founded and wrote up a little site called protectyourcask.com. And that is essentially uh, a quick sort of summary of the law as pertained to the purchase and ownership of whiskey casks. And then also what we've been seeing in the last few years, which disturbs us within that sector, which we will discuss here as well. Joining us today is Mr. Blair Bowman, who is a phenomenal broker and general whiskey personality, should I say. <laughs> you too kind. Uh, active in ways across so many different uh, parts of the whiskey industry over the years. Um, and uh, his exploits are many, so I won't even bother naming them. You can just Google the man's <laughs> name and you'll see, you'll see. And Blair also, both Mark and Blair and myself, um, over the years, we have become more and more concerned about what we've been seeing around uh, Scotch whiskey cask investment, what it means, what it looks like, and most crucially, how it breaks the law uh, in our eyes. So we have studied a bit, become quasi-paralegals when it comes to uh, various excise notices and the Wilger regulations and what have you, what have you. And so I guess what this is now, this webinar, is a public version of conversations that we've been having in private with so many people in the industry that are very concerned about what's been happening. And for people that are tuning in that are not sure what on earth I'm talking about, what we're seeing now is this new wave of opportunities to invest in casks, in, of Scotch whiskey specifically, where by doing so, uh, you might end up making money somehow. But the problem is, this has been a practice that's been around for as long as Scotch whiskey has been going as a modern industry. But the problem we're seeing now is we're seeing the law being broken in such a way that all three of us are pretty convinced there's a car crash coming. So we're going to go into the legal framework, how it works, um, why we think the current legal framework that exists is actually not bad, despite numerous imperfections, but how that legal framework is being abused. Uh, and in so doing, we kind of can see how scammers are scamming. With that, um, I think I've quickly covered things. We'll talk a little bit about the law. We'll talk a little bit about guidance from the Scotch Whiskey Association or the SWA. Um, and we'll also discuss a bit more about simply the red flags to watch out for when you're looking at these scammer companies and how they operate. Um, or not even necessarily scammers, but incompetent actors that are kind of messing about with people's money in a way that disturbs us. So with that, what I'll start with quickly is... Um, Blair and Mark are brokers, so they have done the Scotch whiskey cask investment thing. So some critics might say, oh, these guys have an interest. There's an agenda here. The reason I vouch for these guys is we've been looking, this because brokering has been happening for many, many, many years, it's looking at how this idea of brokering or becoming a representative or an owner of casks or working with clients um, there's a difference between doing it legally and illegally. Um, and so we want to address how it's been done illegally. So I guess from there, I'll stop talking with my big, fat, obnoxious American accent about Scotch whiskey of all things. And I guess, gentlemen, could we talk a little bit about the history of brokering and how it's being been done in the industry and how 
for quite a while, we've had a fairly pretty healthy system that's led to the rise of independent bottlers um, and how we're beginning to see that being abused. Uh, and I'll throw that to either Mark or Blair. Mark, I think you should kick oh, off on that. Yeah, I mean, because this is a fascinating area because people think that cask investment is just something that's done by firms in London with guys in pinstripe suits, but it's not. I mean, the industry has been doing this for a long time and is currently doing this. I mean, if you want to look at current programs, you want to spend tens and hundreds of thousands, if not millions, you can do that directly with the big brand owners like Diageo and Pernod Ricard and Chivas have just released a new program, Dalmore have a program. There's lots of these public ownership options. You go down to the new distilleries, Aaron, Annandale, all these smaller distilleries have them. And I just thought, I've got some interesting, I'm a bit of a geek for these sorts of old little bits, but you know what? Once upon a time, Springbank would send you this in uh, every one of their bottles so that you could go and purchase a cask of Springbank directly from the distillery. So that's Springbank, almost like the anti-investment company selling the casks. You look at the Bracadi, they had a cask ownership program in the early 2000s where you could pick up uh, the price list is here if anyone's interested. A refill uh, hogshead bourbon, £995, all the way up to a fresh sherry hogshead. Oh, no, if let's do a fresh sherry butt, £2,195. And then again, what might be surprising for people is that this is, I don't know if many people have seen this yeah. before, but this is the McAllen on Premier program for their cask investment scheme that they had in the you know early 2000s so these investment programs there's they're not just necessarily all bad i would say that very few independent bottlings of springbank ardbeg mccallum brocladi would have happened if those private owners hadn't have taken the opportunities to buy those casks and put their capital away for a long long time and let's be realistic people have been storing these casks for 20 30 years now so there is this historic precedent but always running alongside this and here's again let's go to the primary sources whiskey magazine this is volume one issue two of whiskey magazine and there's an article in here called false profits and i'll read this out directly this is one company that was shut down by the serious fraud office one investor recently bought a hogshead of mccallum 1989 for four thousand and ninety two pounds which you know is hundreds of thousands, if not millions, depending on the fills and everything like that. But Scotch whiskey industry sources estimate that this is actually worth between 600 and 650 pounds. Wow. So, like, these, the mis-selling has been happening for a long time. You know, the serious fraud office have always come in and shut these things down. But again, we're going to get to the ownership in a bit. But the people who bought those casks for 4,000 pounds in the 1990s and, and early 2000s, they were fortunate enough to have ownership of them. So when those companies were shut down by the serious fraud office, they still retain that cask. And more or as importantly as that is that they were patient. You know, they've wasted like 20, 30 years for this to come. And it isn't a get rich quick scheme like a lot of people may lead you to believe. So that's my little bit on that really. And I guess the interesting thing on that, Mark, is that those were bought in a view that the person could do something with that cask in the future that they were in control of. Whereas I guess the, the difference now, you know, a lot of the new distilleries do offer cask purchase programs, but they're not, you know, framed in a way that's investment. You know, it's about having the journey, having the cask, you know, following the, the maturation of it and then bottling it with your name on the label. And that's the kind of proposition that a lot of distilleries offer nowadays, rather than saying this is going to make you money. You know, that's a very different proposition. Yeah, and I think when you, whenever you look at any investment of time or money, it is an investment, or like expenditure of time or money, it is an investment. And, you know, I am somewhat, you know, with some of these distillery programs, the way that you're only allowed to sell them back to the distilleries. For that's instance. the only option, effectively, that you've got in principle, and that's what's in the terms and conditions, and they're pretty tight on they that, are. and I can understand why. And, and again, like some of them, like historically, like these, like the, the Springbank ones and Brocadi, they bring in retrospective terms like Springbank, you, you have to move the cask out within 90 days of sale and stuff like that. Now, same with Brocadi, you know, they're not opening new accounts for people taking over them. But th I think it's kind of a reaction. These terms are almost a reaction to the mis-selling and mistreatment of them. And I don't necessarily think they would be present if it wasn't for people abusing them and, and profiteering on the back of the industry's goodwill. Yeah. If, 
we look at the history of scams. So throughout the history of Scotch whiskey, there have been scams around owning these casks. There have been promises of insane rates of return on investment, um, mis-selling in all kinds of ways. I think for us, what's been disturbing is just seeing the echo of what we know was already in the past, uh, just coming back for its latest uh, its latest phase. Uh, and and I guess if I can jump in there, Felipe, it's even yeah. worse now because of the rise of social media. Like yeah. back with the last time the scams were happening in the 90s, 2000s, you know, it, that was still in, you know, old school print. You know, the, it was in magazines, it was in, you know, newsprint. Now these guys can target and have, you know, cash to, to throw at Meta and other social media platforms to really target, you know, the exact person that they think is probably quite gullible to getting swept up by very misleading claims of returns of tax. I think we'll get into tax later, um, you know. And I can see why it's become such a, a ballooning effect. And obviously, the timing of this, you know, there was a big surge during um, kind of lockdowns when people had furlough money, you know, and it, at that time also, interest rates were historically extremely low. So there was all of this at play, which I think has kind of created this monster <laughs> that has happened that I think we're going to try and unpick now. And I think another thing that adds to all of that, and this is why it's a perfect storm, because as you just sort of explained, like the, the, the economic situation and the social situation is one thing, but also people don't talk, people often sort of like, oh, where were the fake bottles? For scammers, it's not really worth getting into faking a bottle. There's not many, like the proportion of the market is £10,000 plus, it's very minimal. But you know what? You double up on a cask of Macallan that you're selling for someone, like that you're making hundreds of thousands of pounds. So I think it's always the profits have been always more appetizing for people. And, and that comes with the opacity of the market. If someone's offering you a cask of whiskey for X, Y, and Z, you can't really go and compare that because in most of the places that you can go and compare it to is somebody else who's got a highly inflated stock list as well. It's it's an opaque industry which suits people who want to misrepresent prices. Yeah. And I think the challenge is and what's you know, it's frustrating that actually we are having to spend time this afternoon and have this discussion because in a, in an ideal scenario we wouldn't be having to have this conversation. But I think the reason that we are is that for for this most recent period of of this kind of phase, it's kind of fallen in the gaps. No one's really taken ownership of this problem because you know yes the SWA have put out guidance and I think it's clear and I think we'll talk about that but you know it's not within their remit it's not within what they do same with HMRC because there's no duty points being created because we're talking about casks under bond they're not really that interested to be honest and yes ASA have finally recently woken up to this but it's taken them a long time and I'm still seeing so many blatant breaches of the new guidance that are just companies that couldn't care less or think they're going to get a wrap around the wrist and then you know we'll adjust it again and, you know, same with um, FCA, it's not within the FCA regulations to regulate this. So it's kind of nobody's really taken ownership of it. So frustratingly, it's been people like you and me and Felipe who have been shouting about this, you know, through the internet and saying this has to stop. Um, and it really does, because w the thing that I'm, I hope that we'll talk about soon is that we can see this car crash coming down, you know, or train crash coming down in five, ten years time that people got swept up in the kind of boom times buying in these casks at, let's say, overinflated prices, didn't necessarily realize they were buying an unnameable distillery at that time. You know, did it, it was a bit of a bait and switch. You know, they were reeled in by nice, glossy adverts and websites. And then only then were told, oh, actually, you've got to buy a minimum of a pallet, totally different thing, you know, that they didn't realize they, they wanted, but they thought they were being advertised a cask. And then in, as I said, like five or 10 years' time, these people are going to suddenly remember, oh, yeah, what did I do with that money? Like, oh, I'm going to try and exit. And that either, this is my fear, either these companies will have gone AWOL and some already have started to vanish, you know, domain names dying, telephone numbers dropping, you know, that's already started. But the, the investors won't know until they think, oh, I'm ready to exit that position. And that there could be in the future all these orphaned casks of unnameable whiskey, which is going to create another massive issue and the category damage and all the amazing work that's that's been done to turn around, you know, for example, let's look at McAllen as you, you've already flagged there, Mark, like, what was it the market said? It was about £900 for that yeah, cask at that time. Yeah, you know? So in in what, 20 plus years, the equity involved in the brand of the Macallan has become so globally successful. You know, they've just announced today their new £50,000 um, horizontal, beautiful, architecturally Bentley designed bottle. That's amazing that whiskey is at that level. And, and my fear is that all of that amazing work that's been done across the category could be undermined by a few dodgy charlatans as part of this cabal of businesses that have appeared. Um, and I think that won't come out in the wash until 
these people try and exit. So that's yeah, my thank absolutely. you for letting me it's, it's, Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So what I'll do quickly now is break it down because I think we do have a variety of people checking in, people that are in the industry people that mm. are familiar with the issues, but people that may also not be that familiar with the issues. So if we can bring it back a little bit, um, it'd be great to look at what the actual legal framework for owning a cask is. If you own a cask, how do you own a cask under the eyes of the law? Um, Mark, you're an ownership <laughs> man. <laughs> I think if you look at the, the heart of Protect Your Cask, we zone in on one really narrow piece of advice by the Scotch Whiskey Association, where it, I'll paraphrase it basically says, Make sure you take ownership of it by checking with the warehouse keeper what documents that you needed to be given. Now, essentially, when you're looking at ownership of a cask of whiskey, you're really looking like ownership in any level of item. If you bought a watch from somebody, you'd take delivery of it. Now, the problem with a cask is that it's stored in a warehouse, an excise warehouse, in case somebody's watching here, it doesn't like them being called bonded warehouses. But they're stored in a bonded warehouse and they need to be stored in your name. That's the critical thing. They need to be stored in your name and your name only. Now, this isn't just something that the SWA sort of talks about. It's also something that the excise notices and the legislation talks about. And I'm going to go really aim and just read a few of these bits out because one of the common things that you see on all these websites is that, oh, we've got a WAUGA. We're regulated by HMRC. Well, if it, okay, they're regulated by WAUGA. They're not regulated by WAUGA. They have, they are on the WAUGA registration. Mm-hmm. Now, here I've got it printed off for you. And if anybody wants to go and read it, it's statutory notice 1999, number 1278. So it's basically the WAUGA regulations. And it says, basically, section 9.3 says that relevant goods should not be sold while they are being kept in an excise warehouse unless the seller, or if the seller has a duty representative, that representative gives notice of the sale to the authorised warehouse keeper. So WAUGA is basically saying goods can't be sold under bond unless the warehouse keeper is notified. That's echoed in excise notice 196 in section 5.8, and in excise notice 197, section 8.2 and 8.3. There's an obligation to tell the warehouse keeper who is the owner of the goods. And I think what's what's happened is a lot of warehouses have stopped opening new private accounts for customers as a reaction to the malpractices of a lot of these companies in terms of the warehouses charge a peppercorn rent, you know, 50, 100 quid a year to store two, two cubic meters in their warehouse. They're earning pittance on this. But they're seeing companies making t- like thousands, in, if not tens of thousands of pounds of profit. So they've all stopped opening these new accounts. So you've now got this new system where a third party company will own that cask and then give the person rights to it. And I think the rights is completely different to the ownership. And one of the common legal frameworks, if you want to call it that, that's used by some of these companies is bailment. And bailment works like if you take your bottle of whiskey to an auction house, the auction house has got a right to hold that bottle. You, you know, it's, it's, it's not their bottle, but they're looking after it on your behalf, But which is perfectly fine. But this doesn't really work with casks or, or the danger is with casks is that you've got three people privy to the contract. You've got the buyer, the seller and the warehouse keeper. If the warehouse keeper hasn't acknowledged or signed that contract, then in theory, the owner, the, 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 sell, the, the person who's selling that cask could sell that to 50, 100 people and they're not doing anything wrong. And the warehouse would never know, yeah. And the warehouse would never know that's happened. And it's only in an event of someone trying to get a regauge or calling the warehouse for a sample or whatever. And then the warehouse saying, that cask number doesn't match your name. I and, can't and, do anything about that. You know, it's only in those scenarios where that would all come out. And that's why it comes back to the SWA guidance. And let's be frank here, the SWA guidance have been issued since 1996 about the importance of delivery orders. Yes, there's a change in the legal framework around them. So there's not a legal necessity for a delivery order. But as you've seen in those three excise notices, there is a requirement to notify the warehouse keeper. So a delivery order does that job. And I think one of the things that people often say is that, well, you know, no one's given out new warehouse accounts. And I kind of like, my reaction to that is like, just because you can make money doing something, it doesn't necessarily mean that you should be doing it if you can't do it in the correct manner. So, yeah, I mean, and I think the frustration on that side of things as well is that all of these companies really fill the websites with obfuscation and don't talk about any of this side of it at all, but will show off how nice the glossy certificate is that you get. And it's got wax seals and embossing and gold foiling and delivery orders don't come like that. They just come in a bit of A4 paper or a scanned email, you know, but again, they don't talk about that at all. 
we'll get into this soon enough of how things are done with the scammers or mm. the things that aren't said. Um, the question I'll put to you guys, um, given your experience in the years you guys have done brokering for different clients, how has your job changed over time and also with the relationships with the warehouses and, the, and or the distilleries that you deal with? That's a nice question. Right, yeah. yeah, well, I mean, I think the thing, the, the whiskey industry, as it has always been, is always based on trust. Um, there's a lot of unwritten stuff. There's a lot of unwritten rules. And I think it's really about, you know, working with um, people that you trust. And that's how I've always worked. You know, people don't go behind each other's back and undercut each other. They don't stab each other in the back. And it's not that kind of industry. It never has been, despite there being competitors in these kind of places. I think the challenge has been that lots of these new entrants have come in who really know nothing about whiskey. Um, at all, don't know how to pronounce the names of distilleries, uh, couldn't care less about whiskey, don't even drink it, um, you know, just really have little um, appreciation of whiskey at all, have come into this space. So I think the things that probably Mark will say as well is that the, the change has been pricing. You know, the, the way that these new people have come in have been jacking up prices themselves to try and flip them to punters, but also have come in so naively that a few people have probably made a quick buck off selling some overinflated prices, price casks to these, you know, dodgy businesses as a you know way to just try and get rid of them um but then that in doing so has inflated the price for everyone else and and then that's cut out independent bottlers who you know want to be able to release whiskey at like, like a reasonable fair price but just can't at the minute because there's just been such a, a kind of heat in the market for for these kind of casks so i think those are the the main changes i've seen but i mean as a rule of thumb i don't work with any of these companies at all and um, i've been quoted by many of them trying to get casks because they're clearly struggling to get supply now um, and there's really only a handful of sources that seem to still be happy to supply them. And I think one of the misnomers is that buying a cask of whiskey is kind of like a wholesale operation. It really isn't. If you're a private individual buying one, two, six, whatever casks, that is not wholesale. You do not qualify for wholesale prices. You know, most of these distilleries output is in the millions of litres a year. If you turn up and buy it, you've got six casks. Well, yeah, come on, like place a thousand cask order. That might make us, we might make, you know, we might turn around and have a look at you then, but the small numbers of casks that private individuals buy, it's 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 a misnomer to think that it's a wholesale thing. And I think one of the other really, I know we weren't necessarily going to touch on this, but I think it's really important to talk about is that just because you own a cask of whiskey, it's not, while it may look comparable to the bottles of whiskey, you may think that those are the same raw ingredients. It's a bit like taking, going to Juicens and buying all the materials you need to build the house versus the value of the finished house. You know, there's a lot of skill and expense and time required to bring these, put these products together and put them to market. Look at McCallum. They've taken no age statement whiskey, collaborated with Bentley and have released it at $50,000 a bottle. And you know what? It will fly out and good luck to them. You know, that's fantastic. But you can't do that. Like, you know, even independent bottlers are struggling at the moment because of the lack of consumer spending to sell bottles at, you know, 100, 150 pounds. So there's just this consciousness of like the, the, the cask side. Yes, it is somewhat a wholesale thing, but it's you're definitely not if you're on the, on the private individual side of it. But then also mm -hmm. in the, the way that the these businesses kind of push this forward onto people is not really explaining it on a yielded you know, bottle basis necessarily. So again, we'll try and confuse the person by talking about OLAs and RLAs, you know, and the total price of the cask or the price per OLA and RLA, which is not very helpful if you're, you know, consumer or a layperson. What you really need to do is find out how many bottles are going to come from that cask, how fresh the, the regauge was, and then look at the market and see, right, what is a, an OB, an official bottling, 10-year-old of this thing? You know, and if that price seems about right, then that's okay. But it should be a lot under because, as you've said, Mark, there's a lot of other costs involved of taking a cask from a warehouse and then putting it on a shelf as a finished product, including bottling, labeling, marketing, wholesale margins, retail margins, all of that. You know, so if you're buying if you're buying the cask on a per bottle basis, that's like four or five times what it would cost on the shelf for me to go into a shop today and buy a ten year old official bottling. It makes no sense at all as an investment. But this is what's happening, for, you know, frustratingly. Something I've been seeing, I'm going to cut in, Mark. One of the things that I've been seeing as well is, you know, we're seeing more around, for example, cask auctions, or you can buy these casks, and it's more like casks are being shipped around for the sake of reselling them, um, for the sake of hype, uh, almost, almost as if they become a weird sort of financial product rather than the simple mm. fact that you've got to bottle this stuff and drink it. That's the but I think you just made a really good point. Blending the chain and turning it into instead some kind of weird 
Beanie Baby style product. Yeah. Um, I, I would say what you've just made is a really good point that we've actually not talked about before. But if you own a cask with the rights model, you know, in terms of if you don't have ownership to it, you've got rights to it, you can't contact, let's say, Whiskey Auctioneer or somebody like that to sell that cask because you don't own that cask. You've got rights to it. You'd have to have when casks are sold at Sotheby's or anywhere, you have to have the the full ownership in order to transfer the title because you can't transfer the title through another third party because that's just not how business is done you know if your cask is stored with somebody else and you want to try and sell it it you'd be find hard pressed to find anybody in the industry to hand over their buyer to one of these third party companies to continue the management of it so you know the exits that these people talk about bottling problematic auctions problematic if you don't have the thing and there's lots of you know auctions are just not good for casks it's like Putting details of your debit card online, sure, nobody should do anything with those debit card details because the personal and it'd be fraud. But it's very easy to look at a cask that's online at an auction, copy down all those little cask numbers and stuff like that, and there you've got a legitimate cask to, to sell. Definitely. You know what I mean? Just to circle back on what you were saying there, Philippe, I think the thing that really upsets me and frustrates me most about this whole thing, uh, there's lots of things, but one thing is the fact that it's all very speculative and it's about speculating on the future value of whiskey and not ever actually talking or thinking about what it even tastes like. And I think that's the thing that really gets to me is that, you know, the people that made that whiskey, regardless of which distillery it's from, made it to be enjoyed. And that's the purpose of the whiskey is it should be for opening, sharing, enjoying, you know, creating these memories and experiences, not sitting somewhere in a warehouse being flipped and bought and sold and bought and sold, you know, to increase returns for some middle person that's going to take cuts out of it. That's not actually what it's about. And I think I get that there's a part of the market that that does that. And that's how, you know, the whiskey industry needs to trade to keep things moving. But the the fact that so many of these businesses have emerged that are purely about that, about the speculation of the future value of whiskey, that have no interest in the taste of it is something that I find really upsetting. Sorry, that's my another rant, but I'm going to keep doing this because you're giving me a platform to do it. Yeah, yeah. Well, from there, what I'm actually, I'm going to come in on something and I should have made this clearer earlier, but fortunately we do have a little Chiron going across there. Um, if anybody wants to ask us questions, um, we've got Mark on email duty checking what uh, people might want to come in with. Um, we've got the email for Protect Your Cask there. If anybody's com- coming in with questions, um, we've We'd love to hear from you uh, and we'll answer as best as we can as well. Um, I know that we're live streaming across three different platforms. I'm not seeing it right now because... I've um, got one email come in uh, from Martin uh, and he did a really interesting breakdown of how much it costs to bottle a cask of whiskey because this is substantial. And I think, you know, it's a really good drill down. We might be able to distribute this or put it on the site or something like that. I don't know. But I think one of the things that people always overlook when you're looking at the cost of bottling a cask of whiskey is the marketing cost. Like seriously, like you can put it into bottle for £3.50 in a tour round and a crap label, but you've got to now get 250 units out to the public. Mm-hmm. Felipe, you'll know as an independent bottler, the, the, the marketing side, look at McAllen and Bentley. The marketing side is the majority of this business, and you've got to have huge upfront capital to pay for that to even get those hypothetical sales. And I do. And think- it's such a competitive market as well. There's so many new independent bottlers and established brands. Everybody's fighting for shelf space. Um, and again, lots of uh, consumers naively don't realise that they don't have any of the licences involved needed to, to shift 200 bottles if they wanted to. And this um, is you know, a point that comes back to the naming rights as well. There's a lot of casks that are sold without the actual full naming rights. So instead of, you know, uh, you know, it happens in the wine industry, they have second wines at the Chateau. You know, it's same in the whiskey industry. But, you know, if you're buying the second whiskey from a distillery... And expecting that to sell in anywhere near the same way as the full name, you know, and this is going to have to be done through the you know, trademark sort of system where you can only be distilled at the X, Y, and Z distillery. So it's, you know, this is why naming rights are so important. And there's there's lots of instances where people are buying casks that don't have the full naming rights, or perhaps people don't even necessarily understand the implications of those naming rights because. And again, it's, I think it's through obfuscation from these brands. They know, the seller knows, you know, in the boiler room, they absolutely know that they're selling unnameable spirit, but they're, they're not going to let on to that, to the naive person that's made an inquiry that said they want to drop 10, 15, 20 grand with that business. You know, I've heard so many examples of that, of people who have not realized that they've bought unnameable spirit, um, which just completely is not value less, but it's a lot less valuable than if they could have the name. Of and I think if we can break it down, Mark, I'm going to cut in there. So we're, we're, 
we're talking quickly about the best practice when buying a cask for the people that are looking to buy casks, or let's say, for example, it's rather safe to buy from a distillery. I think that's a right. Yeah, I think as long what? as it's an established distillery that you can see. What, no, so my question is, what should people look for? What's good basic practice uh, to look for when buying a cask? So I'll, I'll, I'll go briefly on yeah. this. So I think it's either two things. It's either ownership, complete, full, open ownership, where you're getting a delivery order and you're in charge of that cask. Because look at those Macallans that were part of a scam in the 2000s. They've turned into be a good investment still. Or I still think there is a place for this other market where people have this management under cask. Like, uh, you know, but people have to go into that openly and transparently and understand those risks because that is compounding the risks on an unregulated market. If you're comfortable for that other company to hold that cask for an indeterminate period of time, fine. If you're walking in with your eyes open, but I think it's when you're not, that's, that's a concern. I think there's a few other things, if I can add on top of that, definitely on the ownership, I think that's critical. But I mean, also, if it's being viewed as an investment, not something in a bottle and drink, even though I think it should be, you need to be buying it at a reasonable price. You know, if you're buying it at a ridiculous price that not even your great grandchildren will make a return on, then why even bother? You know, I think that's part of the, the issue here. So yes, you need to be able to buy on a fresh regauge, so you need to know what you're actually buying. If it's mature stock, you should really, you know, be getting a sample of it so you know that it's not been in a dud cask or that it's faulty. You know, it happens sometimes. Um, you know, it's buying, you know, something on paper can sound amazing and delicious and you get a sample through and it's, you know, just a bit underwhelming or, or not as exciting as it should be. But you wouldn't know that if you're just buying on paper. So I think those are those are some things that I definitely say are important to check as well. We've got a question come in from James on email. He says, how do you actually get naming rights? Being told by a broker that the cask has naming rights, is that enough or should there be something official? Again, this is where the mm -hmm. delivery order comes in important and communication with the warehouse because it's very easy for somebody to print a certificate off with one name, but the warehouse of yes. people that have got to confirm what's come in by the EMCS, the Excise Movement Control System, I think. So if, yeah. if the warehouse keeper is telling you that you bought x and it's saying x and that's absolutely fine but if you've bought in the secondary name of that brand it will not have come into his warehouse and it should be on the invoice and what you're invoiced as well it should be very clear and what but, but what invoices you're purchasing. Are to manipulate i'd say you can print an invoice but it's that verification of it so even yeah. if you've not got the ownership you can call up the warehouse keeper and confirm what details they're holding is the right way to go about it really jane so yeah good question mm. Yeah, yeah, very good question uh, and important as well. But I mean, I think another thing on this to kind of come back to you, your point there, Felipe, is like, do you really, really want to invest in whiskey? Like, how critical is it to you that you actually want a cask? Like, is that really fundamental to your you know, outlook at the moment, your horizon for investments? You know, if not, you might actually be, and I've had conversations recently with this with various people, is actually you might be better putting that money in a stocks and shares ISA in Diageo, in Perno, in, you know, whoever you want. That is in a safe, you know, tax-free wrapper. Um, you get your 20,000 allowance every year. There's the potential to new 5,000, you know, British ISA. You know, that, I think, is a safe way of doing it. And you're buying it at the market rate of what that business is worth. You know, a lot of these businesses are currently, you know, under quite a bit um, because of recent kind of financial years. So, you know, maybe that's worth looking at rather than just buying, rather than thinking, I've got 10 grand, I'm going to throw it at a cask that you might never make a return on in the future. And look at it objectively, like if we're gonna, if you wanna make an investment in whiskey, and I do get like the thing is with whiskey and casks, I get that it's a beautiful generational sort of thing. If you've just had a child, you buy them a cask and you leave it for 18 years, you know, it's, it's something that's a bit different to park some money into. But like, if you're looking to do this on an institutional sort of way, and why aren't there pension funds and hedge funds into casks? Well, they're into bottles because it's data driven. And it's that transparency of data there. But like Blair says, you can go and buy an artisanal spirits and support the SMWS and Diageo and whatnot. But you know, people want to diversify. And I think that comes back to your earlier point, Blair, of this, this trust generally of in, like the alternative sphere. It's huge now with, with a younger generation. Uh, two more questions come in or one more question. Uh, someone's asked, is this being recorded? Felipe, I think it would be being recorded here. Yeah, we are. Uh, this will be uploaded somehow. It's possible it's just going to even live on my profiles the moment we stop. But I think we've also got a download of this so that we can upload it to the Protector Cask. 
And another good question here from Sheila. She said, is there a way to confirm a company's WAUGA registration number? No, basically. Uh, yeah, it's odd that. I find that really odd because you can look up AWS and VAT and you know other things for a company, but not WAUGA. For but I think reason. let's look at the, like, the misnomer of WAUGA. A WAUGA is a bit like a bus driver or a truck driver saying they've got a driving license from the DVLA. But of course, yeah, that's like a basic requirement for your job. You know, we sell alcohol. I've got a personal license and a premises license. I've not got a WAUGA because I don't own any casks and have never owned any duty suspended goods. So a company that's saying you've got a WAUGA, and there was a case recently, uh, Martin Armstrong, the whiskey broker, he he sort of uh, put it out on his Facebook that somebody else was using his WAUGA number on their website. Wow. So like, it's... I find it quite funny as well how, again, lots of these companies will talk about in their marketing, and I've seen it in press releases, how they have an extremely prestigious WAUGA, you know, and that so yeah. few businesses yeah. get get a WAUGA. And I'm like, that's absolute nonsense. <laughs> absolute just nonsense. And um, can I just flag something? Because it just came to my mind when you were mentioning that, Mark, about bottles. Again, there's, there's a big mess between conflating casks and bottles mm -hmm. and i think on the one hand the night frank index you know that we've seen over the last several years has been great in a way because it's really shown how amazing whiskey is compared to other asset classes and i think that's exciting and again that's raised everybody's you know levels up and really put scotch whiskey in particular you know i guess japanese as well but really put whiskey really really high up there but the frustrating thing is that so many of these companies are conflating casks and bottles and they're not the same thing and they never will be the same thing and the way that i've explained it you know several times to journalists is that it's like saying this particular blue pigment is the same pigment that picasso used and this picasso painting was bought for a thousand dollars and now it's worth a hundred million dollars and it's going to go up in that value. It's not the same thing. And it is really just gets under my, oh, it really I, gets to me. The guy I see that, so many businesses the, using the that. editor of the covering, the editor covering the Knight Frank uh, Rare Whiskey Index has said publicly, I think it was for Whiskey Magazine, that we don't do casks. We have nothing to do with casks. I think a lot since there's been some coverage of the whole Knight Frank Index, 556% garbage thing, numbers that were thrown away. Yeah. I've seen a lot of the interesting firms take that number away uh, from their marketing materials. We're seeing less of it these days. So, Well, it's now within the a ASA guidelines. Uh, so within the advertising standards rules that came in force in January this year, that's right. they, they can't use that because it's misleading. Uh, because, yeah, the Knight Frank Index was what, 100 very specific very, very specific bottles that did increase in that value during that time frame, but that's not the same as an unnameable cask that it's not going to increase that, you know, the same in that time frame. And well, I, think, I guess to draw, and I'll, and I'll come to you, Mark, in a second, I think something that's really important to stress, you guys touched on it, but I want to just drive it home. When we're looking at, we're not talking about bottle investment today. Bottle investment is own game, but with bottle investment, whatever's going on, um, and there's issues in that as well, but the data is clear. The data is transparent. There's loads of it. You can access it. So you know what's happening and what has happened. With casks, there is no data on what's happened to sales. There's only some really, frankly, I'll say minor bits of very odd information that has been released there, here and there that you frankly can't trust. So therefore it's worthless. Um, and that's something that's really important to consider yeah. as well with this market. It's literally a market with no real data on it um, as things stand right now. Sorry, Mark, go for it. No, I was going to say like, what we should start doing is just, just have a quick broad and like, you know, we're kind of calling this, you know, trying to call out what, what is happening here and you, and you can politely call it whatever it is in polite terms. Fraud Act 2006 is three, uh, like parameters for fraud and it's fraud by false representation fraud by failure to disclose information where there's a legal duty to do so and fraud by abusive position and i think it's very easy to apply fraud by false representation and fraud by abusive position to a lot of these situations and i think this is the real tinder point if a barrister or law firm picks up that a lot of people have been missold as in would they have entered these investments knowing the facts about ownership than rather than what they were told you could start to see a serious amount of cases mounting up, which, again, would create this huge level of distrust in the industry and come down. And this is what m all of us are concerned about with the, the reputational damage the whole whiskey industry could face with this. You know, it's not just as narrow as these companies. Exactly. It's these stories blow up internationally and the whole face of Scotch gets damaged. And this is why, you know, 
the whole point of Protect Your Cast came about because there is industry guidance. It's just not very well easy to find. It's on a blog from four years ago on a PDF that isn't indexed by Google. Brilliant. Yeah. (laughs) And I think, again, one of the frustrations, though, is that, you know, these companies are all here making a quick buck because Scotch whiskey is the hot thing, you know, thanks to Night Frank Index and other sources. But, like, it's the hot thing, and they'll, they, they'll all jump somewhere else because they've all jumped from something to come into whiskey. But right. the frustration is that when this car crash, train crash, whatever it is, happens, and it will happen, let's be honest, we will be the ones left to pick up the pieces. Um, you know, it will be those of us who are genuine and passionate about whiskey, we will be the ones left when all the house crumbles down. So we've got another question here from Greg, and this is a good one. Quick question about the destiny of casks. So many independent bottlers are desperate for casks right now. I think that's slightly different given the downturn in sales at, at, at retail at the moment. Uh, but do you see an eventual opening for individuals who own casks to sell them to established bottlers? Yes, if you own that cask. But if you have that cask through a third party, like how do you sell it to that independent bottler? You've got to go through that. Yeah. So the majority of those independent bottles of Springbank and stuff and Brookladdy and Aaron are coming from those original private owners who bought these 20 odd years ago. So absolutely right. But again, it's a very nuanced thing and we could do a whole webinar just about that really. Yeah. And I'm going to, I'm going to also touch on this as well, because we're seeing a situation where, um, cat, where people are just getting radically overcharged by on their casks. So when somebody that owns such a cask, even if they actually own it, if they pay too much for it, which is, a big thing right now, uh, bottlers won't want to touch it because it, there's no actual marketable way of selling it because sure, you might have a pretty yeah. decent cask or something, but if you're trying to sell it for a price, that means you get even your money back when the bottler works in his or her actual costs of putting it in the bottles, getting it out there, never mind the margins if you choose to sell to retailers. And then that's even if you work in distributors or something like that, there's just no way that that bottle is going to work as a product. So therefore, the cask is unsellable. Yeah. And the exit strategy, if you've overpaid for your cask, the exit strategy that I've seen quoted by many of these firms that are overcharging for their casks, the exit strategy of selling the bottles isn't actually possible. And, um, and I think... Well, I mean, sorry. Yeah, go on. I, I mean, I've had it quoted to me when I've had a lot of unsolicited cold calls from these companies, which is always quite hilarious. Um, and I shared a voicemail of one that I got recently on my LinkedIn. Um, but anyway, I mean, I've had one quote to me recently that what they do is actually their fastest exit strategy is to s- give you back the cash that you put in and then they'll sell it to the next guy in the chain or the next person that's come into their sales funnel. I mean, and that is effectively a Ponzi scheme that that's not an exit. That's just selling it on to the next person. And that will only last until someone finally says, hang on, why, why is it this much money? That's when it will all fall apart for these businesses. And I think there's something, again, in degrees of risk. If you buy a young cask, if you buy like a five, 10 euro cask or something, like look at those Macallans, for instance, and you pay two, three, four times market value. Yeah, you've been stung. But if you own it and you've got enough time, you can get out. But I was approached last week by a chap who'd spent a hundred thousand pounds on a cask of 1996 Glenrothes, you, you know, more than double what you would expect to see in the market. Mm. Like, so I think with those younger casts, you've got if you've got time, you can take it and you could probably get out of it some way. But in an instance like that, where you've paid fifty thousand pounds to him, which is nothing that the market can do to help you get that money back, like it's. it's- but then on, on top of that, there's a ticking time bomb. I, mean, I think this is why whiskey is so different than, let's say, art. If you bought that piece of art, if it was an artwork that was hundred thousand pounds, you could hold on to that artwork as long as it's in good condition indefinitely. But if it's a cask, it's sitting in a warehouse and that ABV is going to be creeping down to 40% and you've got your angel share. So it's pretty different in that sense, you know, compared to other assets that people are buying that you could hold on to forever and have multi-generational kind of passing on in a lineage of succession. And I think You can't necessarily do that depending on how old the cask is when you buy it to begin with. And I think everything that we've touched on so far is talking about the risk and, and actually it's the same with any investment in being fully aware of the risks when you walk into it. Of course, if you, you, you take a painting into your room, that, that that's minimal risk versus sort of owning a cask stored in a third party hundreds if not thousands of miles away from you comes with different levels of risk and it, it's i think if people were just much more aware of what they were walking into then you would I, I don't think we would have seen as much investment because people would have been a bit concerned about those risks and likewise you know you go back to those people who were buying cash from Brookladdy, for instance, in 2001. That was a risk. You know, the distillery is being closed for all these years. 
like, are they going to make it? Even Springbank, they closed down in the 1980s. And I assume that program that they had was to get some quick revenue in. You know, so those people were taking a risk, which has paid off, but like they were fully aware of what they were walking into. And I think that's the problem. There's so much misdirection in this market, which is unfortunate, really. Not all casks are the same. You know, there's so many variables of distillery, spirit type, wood type. You know, so many variables and a lot of people, I think, again, just don't realize what they've bought until, you know, they, they hear something like this and then they wake up and they're like, oh, hang on, what have I got here? I'm going to go and check. And I think just I just make one quick point, Felipe. Like we've been talking about private individuals here, like maybe I'm buying one or two casks here. I, I'm, I would put some money on this. that There's some funds out there that have invested hundreds. I mean, I know some private individuals that invested millions with some of these companies and are struggling to, to take ownership. So. There will be some people coming along that have realized how much they've invested and they can afford big lawyers. Do, do, do you know what I mean? And I think this is what's going to start potentially coming down the road with some of these companies. I would have thought like, and yeah. we've got to look after our industry. It's so good. I think the SWA thing is like 20, 20, 20 or 40,000 people employed because of Scotch whiskey. We've got to be careful. Uh, we've got to be prayerful to sort of like protect our industry. Yeah. Mm. And the, the, as we kept saying, the category damage could be big. And, you know, that's why I'm hoping that there's a way that somehow this can be kind of nipped in the bud and that, you know, things can be put in place to kind of clamp down on this mis-selling and fraud and everything before the damage becomes too big mm. or bigger than it's going to become. <laughs> Again, another question on email, sort of trying to sort of uh, determine how you can sort of assess whether a price is fair. And there isn't really too much that you can do. Martin, Martin has sent us some really good information, so I might see what we can do with that. But again, you've got to weigh up, you know, you could have two identical casks and, and if the ownership proposition is different, if one is owned with a delivery order and one is owned without a delivery order, that's a different proposition. You know, some yeah. bonded warehouses that I've seen now that are catering to private individuals, it's like 500 quid to open an account, you know, there's a thousand pound closing fee and stuff like that. And you know what? I, it might not necessarily be fair compared to what the trade are paying, but the trade is storing a thousand casks a year with them. You know, if you're a private storing one cask, you're going to expect to pay different rates on these things. So like for like with casks is so difficult. And again, <laughs> it doesn't really help you, James, sorry, but it is so difficult, really. But maybe checking the price per bottle against the current market of what an OB would be or or an independently bottled whiskey of the same cask, you know, or as close as you can find and seeing how that benchmarks. But again, you're having to keep in mind that that's on the shelf with fat, with duty, um, you know, with all of these margins, not actually the cost just of the liquid. Well, I'm going to be people. Here. So, so um, people asking here, how do you determine a fair price for a cask? So, Martin, you've sent us a really good PDF over. Uh, I'm going to mention you by name, Martin Purvis, Hedrum on LinkedIn. Um, get that, what you've just sent us onto your LinkedIn profile, because he does some really interesting stuff. Martin's like a, a, a cask broker, but the vessels, he works at a cooperage, puts out really interesting information. So, Martin, get that on your LinkedIn. Great content. Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of people will sort of thank you for that. So the, the other one I'll throw out there, I'm going to, I'm going to plug you, Mark. You've got a handy dandy cask calculator that people can. Find. Yes, you do. Uh, actually, it's, it's good. It's slightly outdated. I think we need to update the duty on there, but yes, you can use that as well. But again, this is. So this helps. So I'll plug the cask, the Mark Little or LTD cask calculator uh, it needs its own theme tune now. But what I'll mention is if you're not sure about what on earth you've got in that cask, you can have a play with something like that. Um, but I think your, yours is the only real calculator I've come across. Well, I was gonna say, if you know, what a bottle price will look like compared to something equivalent uh, that's already been bottled. And that's one way of at least at least getting some kind of ballpark, some kind of idea of what may be in there and how that compares to what's already on the market compared to. And also probably one thing to flag, sorry for yeah. on that, is to be careful if, if the business that's offering you a cask is giving you data on that, you know, where, what's the source of that? You know, because again, I've seen very misleading data where it's been internal data of what that company's achieved selling probably back onto the next person in the queue. You know, that's not very helpful. That's not very realistic data at all. But they might mislabel it to make it imply like it's some other index or some other uh, kind of way of tracking cask prices. That's not necessarily the case. I've seen, I've seen a company that uh, talked about the kind of gains you could get on a cask and about customers they had and the percentages they made off the sale of their cask. And then they actually included in very small print um, how those casks were sold, transparent data, and they were just sold back to the company. So it was yeah. just simply, it was almost like this company was paying for its 
almost paying a markup to be able to claim that it's client to get those claims. Yeah, yeah that's very odd. Behavior. Very, very odd. Um, so very things there. So data is important. And, and but again, there is literally as things stand, no data on casks, and that's that just highlights that. Um, and I think when there is a little bit of data, people can try and point to it saying it's real data. We don't really have real data. I, I'm, I'll repeat that again. Sorry, Mark, go for it. And then no, and I just, to wrap up, I think. Yeah, I'll, I'll make this point very quickly because I think it's quite important as well to make is that, that a lot of people, some people are needing, some people, because of the nature of the selling was so casks, you couldn't afford to hold them for 10, 15 years, which is exactly what you need to do with the cask investment. So they're going back to the companies that have sold them the casks in the first place and saying, can you resell them? And lo and behold, quite often, they're not able to sell them in a timely manner. And they think, oh, it's just the market. Well, I think I've got a personal hot take on that in terms of all the profits in it for the first person they sell it for. And then if they bring that cask back at an inflated price and try and resell it to another one, why waste an old cask with all the profit gone when they could just get a new cask and put all the profit back in? But that's just my hot take on that. No proof. I think you're absolutely right. There's actually some really great uh, live examples of one star reviews that have exactly that scenario happening um, on various trust pilot pages for various uh, so called whiskey cask investment companies that have the customer seeing exactly that scenario that they, you know, wanted to hold it for 10 years. For whatever reason, you know, their cash flow is tight, they need to get an exit, but the business hasn't been able to exit or has offered them under what they'd originally paid. Um, just as a way to, for then, as you just said, so that a business can then flip it on uh, to try and make another. And I'm just going to do a quick it. reality check because people are coming in again about the pricing thing. Look, if you're a private individual, you have not got the buying power of these independent bottlers who will be likely getting discounts. So you will always expect to see some deviation from like the shelf price because there's there's whole there's some of these bottles are often sold at very low margins, but over high volumes through a company. So you're always going to expect to see a bit. So it's you can't even con- compare like using the calculator or whatever to see if that's accurate. But I think the biggest risk with those overpricings with the, with the very old premium casks, because you can just be poof, taken to the moon and back with those. Yeah. And if it's under 45% ABV at the point of purchase, you can't yeah. hold it that long because its resale value is just going to get less and less attractive and could then become unnameable whiskey and just become a spirit drink if you're not lucky. With that, gentlemen, what I'm going to do is I'm going to very quickly summarize, uh, I guess, best practice. Okay. <laughs> um, I will say also, for uh, if you go to www.protectorcat.com, this covers a bit of what we've talked about in more detail. We don't quite go into the overpricing situation too much, but we do cover the law. We do try and make it easy to understand. We do cover red flags um, that scammers are using to try and show uh, – they're, they're using to try and hawk stuff that's just not quite there. Um, but to summarize is essentially have a look at the SWA guidance. We do talk about it and do put a link to it on protectorcast.com, but do find it, do have a read through it because it's a small document that's got a lot in there and it's all very, very good information based on UK law. Um, and the most important thing of all is make sure you can get in contact with the warehouse that owns your cask and they know who you are. That is the backbone of all of it. The rest is details. Um, so that's a really, really important one. And then also, and in doing so, this helps confirm ownership. And then I guess the other way that you can get scammed on beyond just ownership stuff is price. Do your best to just make sure uh, because everyone's overcharging right now across so many different fronts for many different reasons. But casks are just simply too expensive. The casks are just too expensive. So in that way, in that way, though, that means that you should really try and check as thoroughly as possible before you go into any kind of deal whatsoever. Um, and I think I'll I'll leave my summary at that. I'll leave my summary at that. I think that's very good. Well, b- before we log off, I just want to say congratulations to the two of you for actually taking the initiative and time and investment of your own time and resource to put together the website because it's definitely needed. Um, and as I said at the top of this, like. Hopefully there'll be a point in the future where we don't need this kind of conversation and we don't need a website like this, but we do right now. And I think it's important to, you know, have that. So thank you for taking and a big shout out to that together. As well. We did a lot of the content on Protect Your Cask. So yeah, big shout out to Hannah as well. Absolutely. Hannah Thompson's been an absolute star in helping us get that site going for sure. Um with that, to everybody watching. Thank you for joining us. We hope that wasn't too dry or ranty, uh, but hey, it is what it is. And we hope that it helps people conceptualize kind of what's happening in a very niche part of an industry 
uh, right now that we absolutely love and adore and don't want to see harmed. Uh, so with that, I think we'll end the live stream. Mark and Blair, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, take care, everybody. My pleasure. Bye, everybody. See you again soon. Bye.